Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I'm Ramon Mejia. I'm here to bring you the latest celebrity news, reviews, and of course author interviews. Uh, this week is episode number 102 of the show. If you were wondering where 100 episode 101 went, uh, that was a very nice interview I did with uh, Dakota Kraut recently. That's one back. Uh, and this is episode 102. And this week I have 11 new Lit RPG reviews just for you folks at home. Uh, and that includes uh, Jerry... God and Morna Dune, uh, a little bit of adventure. Uh, second up is going to be Fizzle Sprock. Everybody loves Large Chess, Volume 2 in that particular series. And then after that, it'll be Threadbare, Volume 3. After that, it'll be Dungeon Guild. Uh, this is the third book in that particular series. Then it'll be The Slaver, Vertem, Lit RPG, Episode Number 2. Uh, then it'll be Dead Man Gaming. Uh, and after that, it'll be Tales of the Gemsmith, Chapter 1. Then after that, it'll be Outpost, a little RPG adventure, Monster Mises and Magic, book number one. Uh, after that, it'll be Archaic Venture uh, of Myth. It's a Archaic Adventure, the Myth of Cerberus. And then after that, it'll be New Life Plus, Young Again and In Another World, volume number one. Uh, after that, last but not least, it is going to be, if I can find the button, <laughs> The Ritualist, uh, written by Dakota Kraut. So we'll have all those reviews in just a minute. Before we do that, though, we begin our show, though, with... Lit RPG News. And apparently our pictures don't want to show up, so there it is. Uh, in Lit RPG News, we're going to begin with... Uh, there's actually just one story. Not a lot of news happening this week, um, but it's going to be uh, episode number one of this particular show. I had a nice uh, author interview with Dakota Kraut talking about his latest novel, The Ritualist, which is that one you just saw up here. Uh, and it's you'll have the review in a little bit, but he actually gets some nice insight into the mechanics of his story. He answered some um, questions from the audience. It was a live broadcast on YouTube, uh, and some folks were nice enough to, to jump in and... and <laughs> side of comments and talk amongst themselves and also talk to us and it was a very fun experience uh it's always nice to talk to dakota Crowd about um his stuff uh but that's kind of it for a little bit of news uh oh wow so me and dakota also showed up on another author's uh podcast uh drinking with charles uh for charles dean he has a youtube page uh him and i were both on one of the last episodes uh so you can also go check that out Okay, out now. These are the stories that are out now that I haven't read yet. Uh, there's there's a lot. Just like there are 11 Little Pidgey novels that I reviewed this week, there's even more coming out every single day. Uh, and that includes Fragged number nine, um, written by Zacharias, uh, Zachariah Dracolius. I'm not going to be reviewing that one. I kind of fell out of that particular series. It's off and on Little Pidgey, but it's out for the folks who are enjoying it. Um, also out on March... Well, this week, I should say, um, which is past March 15th, Permadeath Online, book number two, uh, and also out is From the Beginning, Kingdoms Reborn, book number one. Uh, Axelion 99 is also out. Um, the Metropolis, Futuristic Dungeon Core. This is uh, the fourth book in that series of The Laboratory, written by Skylar Grant. It actually came out mid-February, apparently. And for some reason, it just never showed up on my uh, Amazon daily searches for Little PG. Uh, so I'm letting you know about it now. Uh, also, out is The Legacy Builder. Um, and Omega Verse number six by G.R. Cooper is also out as well. So that one's one where a lot of people were looking forward to, to seeing at some point. Um, it's out now. Also, out is The Blade Mage Beastmaster. Um, a very interesting mix of titles. Um, favorable number eight is out as well. The Crown and the Key. I won't be reviewing this. I kind of, again fell out of this particular series and again when, when it comes to like these longer series like five six nine books into it like if you don't you are uh, by that point you're already kind of on board or you're not uh so and sometimes i've just fell off board um doesn't mean it's bad it's just you know whatever um also out as well though is uh, by Harmon cooper cherry Pl blossom girls i don't want to give a, a quick disclaimer on this one this just came out and the author's disclaimer is that uh, there are some serious sexual themes um according to the author's descriptor, and it's currently number one in fantasy erotica. Um, so be aware of what the story is about, in part, at least. Um, I'm going to be rereading it, uh, hopefully, next week, and have a review, full review for you, but just a heads up. 
Okay, uh, new lit RPG audiobooks that are out. We had The Bathroom Night, um, Volume 2 by that same guy, Charles Dean, I was talking about before. Um, Fizzle Sprocket, Everybody Loves Large Chess, Volume 2, uh, the same novel I'll be reviewing today, uh, is also out as an audiobook. So good on Jeff Hayes and uh, Sambu Theater for getting that out almost in the same week. I think they were about a week apart as far as their um, release dates were. Um, the Trap for the Potentate, book number three in the Dark Herbalist series, is also out as an audiobook currently, as is Andrew Novak's On the Lost Continent, which is the second book in that particular series that is also out as a lit RPG audiobook. So plenty of things there. Also, don't forget that in the review, in the full show notes for the podcast, we'll have um, links to all the ebook reviews for each one of those titles, just in case you don't remember what it was about or you're not you've only been listening to audiobooks, we'll have the reviews of the ebooks version in case you want to check, check those out to make sure that those novels um, work for you. Okay, upcoming Litter BG. These are just the titles that I, I know in advance that uh, that we have release dates for, things for the next couple of months, just me reading stuff. You can skip ahead if you want to, but there are a couple new titles. Um, Achilles Reign is going to be out on March the 16th, just in a, another day or so. Um, this one is kind of new, Warden on Warden. Nova Online by Portal Books. This is going to be the first book in that particular series. It is written by Alex Knight. It'll be out on March the 19th. Um, just a slight side note, uh, this is from Publisher Portal. Um, it was a um, the publisher um, company, Taryn Matharu. I'm probably saying that wrong, man, sorry. Um, he sent me a message saying, oh, this is our first uh, Little Bridge audio book. He is a well-known um, fantasy writer for the Summoner series. That's the name of his series. Um, super nice guy, good writing. Um, but he kind of fell in love with Little Bridge and he formed his own publishing company so that um, the genre could kind of have a foot in. He's based out of in, in England, apparently, um, but he plans to try to promote the genre and do more stuff with us. And this is his first, his publishing company's first title in in Little RPG. I think it's probably the first title they've published yet as well, but here it is. Uh, so hopefully we'll all enjoy it. Um, also out on March 19th is going to be Ghost in the Game. This is the third book in the Dream State saga. Um, I'll be actually be talking to the author of this particular novel, Christopher Keen, um, this weekend. Um, so feel free to send in some questions for him. Um, and we'll have a nice author interview with the guy. So we'll see how that goes out. Um, also coming out at the end of March, on March the 30th, it is be The Land of the Undying, which is the first book in the Dark Elf Chronicles. Uh, on April the 4th, going in April now, uh, Betrayal. Uh, this is the second book in the Monster Maces and Magic series. Um, yeah, book two. On April the 10th, it'll be Absalon's Fate, a lit RPG quest, the Everlands book number one. On April the 23rd, the Countdown, Reality Benders book number one is going to be out. Also on May the 10th, it'll be Mightier Steel, a lit RPG uh, game lit novella. Um, so there you go. And also on May the 10th, it'll be Blind Gambit. On May the 17th, it'll be The World of Karak 2, the First Crusade. Uh, May the 24th will give us the third book, in the Alter Game series, uh, book number three, God Mode. On May 27th, Kingdom Level 5. On May 28th, this is going to be the second book in the um, Arkemi Online series, also known as the Dragon Rider um, Adventure series. Um, Trial by Fire, uh, May 28th on that one. And again, new to the list, it'll be uh, this will be out on May the 30th. Uh, the Dead Rogue, a NPC path book number one. Um, this one is being translated from Russian into English by Magic Dome Books. You might have heard of them from uh, the same folks who, who translate the novels for um, the Silly Mahenko and the Way the Shaman series. And so you can always actually look at a, a nice early chapter selection from these novels if you go to their website. And that's it for, for upcoming Little RPG. On to new releases and reviews. <laughs> Hey, that picture worked. Excellent. Okay, on to new releases and reviews. We're going to begin with Jerry, God of Morina Dune. There you go. A little RPG adventure, Hellraisers of Morina, book number one. Um, this is a really easy review. 30 pages, 99 cents, available on Kindle Limited. Totally not worth your time. Um, I'm not even going to read the novel description. It has very little to do with the actual story. Um, it's not little RPG. Um, it's even if it is set in a kind of a game world, um, it's basically two jerks who enjoy hurting players and NPCs complaining that they can't log out suddenly and kind of feeling some of the consequences when things are turned them. But it's again, no RPG progression. 
Um, that's kind of it. So uh, it gets a score of four to a 10 for just basically not being a little bit G like it says it is. And it just, you know, wasn't a good time reading it either. Okay. Number two, um, fizzle sprocket. Everybody loves large chess volume. Number two written by Nevin Ilyev. There you go. Uh, this one is 306 pages, $3.99 cents. Remember, though, it is not available on Kindle Unlimited. The author actually has these stories, I believe, on the Royal Road, the unedited versions of it. Um, so he can't be on Kindle Unlimited. So um, there you go. Here's the author's description. Things are not well within the Lord Drag Empire. An entire city goes up in smoke and ash, and an entire province is slowly being consumed by an ever-expanding cloud of death. But while the humans rally to contain the fallout from this disaster, they are much quicker to pin the blame for it on, on their elven neighbors to the north. With centuries worth of strife and bad blood between the two nations flaring up, all-out war is rapidly becoming an inevitability. Powerful figures are already on the move. Some wish to unravel the mysteries behind the dead city in order to bring the perpetrators to justice. Others are more than content to use this as an act of terrorism as an excuse to further the Empire's agenda. A select few are even planning to somehow turn this cataclysm into a weapon for the sakes of their ambitions. The elves of Ishgar Republic are hard at work undermining and sabotaging their old enemy, while the international community watches the ongoing situation with a critical eye. Even the gods themselves are closely monitoring the situation, ready to intervene should they deem it necessary. However, although all these entities have different reasons and methods, they all have the same objective to find the mastermind responsible for setting it all in motion. The same mastermind that is too busy figuring out how wagons work to notice the world is stirring. And the author does give a content warning. Um, profanity, gore, violence, explicit adult content. And that is totally true this time around. Um, Price-wise, this is very fine. Um, 306 pages for $3.99. Reasonably priced. Um, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize it again for the author. Uh, there is some graphic, graphic sex at the beginning of the story. Uh, there's a lot of cursing in this entire novel. Um, a lot of like um, name calling things that are very graphic and sexual at the same time. Um, and the be that's basically what the beginning of this novel is. Now, if you want to skip that portion, uh, if you want to, you know, avoid all that, you can kind of just skip the first um, 38%. Uh, sorry, the first, yeah. I'll go, skip the first 37, 38%. Um, and it gets better after that. Like there's a, there's a lot less of that sex stuff um, there. If that's not really your thing, um, I'll um, this novel and the series in general are slice of life stories. In this case, the protagonist of the series is a mimic. It's a monster. It's a monster that can change shape. It looks in, in general lore like a treasure chest, but when you get up to it, it grows teeth and it eats you. Uh, and in book one, that mimic became self-aware and he absorbed class skills and spells and powers from the adventurers that it ate. And now it's free of the dungeon that it lived in and it's exploring the larger world. And that's kind of what the story is. Um, the beginning of the part of the story is, again, not my favorite. Um, it's, it's kind of aimless. It's mostly just the main character killing and exploring his powers, which is fine. But there's some very graphic and frankly brutal sex um, that just made it unappealing to me. Um, again, the story got interesting for me after the 38% mark when the mimic MC goes into the big city, disguise himself as an adventurer. He goes on quest, he wins loot, XP, even learns some crafting skills, which is kind of fun. And the story takes some very interesting turns at that point. And, and basically the, the novel description that, that I read you and you know, the picture on the cover, all that stuff only happens after the 38% mark. So again, everything before that is really kind of not necessary. The author wrote it. So, and I mean, I mean, it's information that I guess adds a little bit of character development, maybe. Um, but you can absolutely skip it and not lose anything. Um, and the story even actually takes on um, something approaching a plot uh, uh, after that point, I, especially towards the end of this novel, um, which was kind of nice because that means like the rest of the series is like, oh, maybe there's going to be an actual plot here instead of just the adventures of our mimic buddy this week kind of stuff, which is fine, but not that doesn't really work for everybody. Um, overall, I had a good time with the novel. Um, I was definitely turned off by the graphic sex at the beginning, but like so you can absolutely skip it. Um, just go to the 38% mark. Um, the stuff that happened there totally fits with the nature of like the demons and the the monsters that are summoned, but it just didn't work for me. Um, I just, like I said, skip it to avoid it, and you'll probably have a better time with it. Um, I so enjoyed myself. Um, um, I have given a score of 7 out of 10. It's a good score. I had a good time overall. Um, and there you go. That's Fizzle Sprocket. Everybody loves Lars Chest. Uh, volume number two. 
uh, with the score of 7 out of 10. Okay, on to our next review, which is going to be Threadbare Volume 3, The Right to Arm Bears. So nice twist instead of bear arms, arm bears. Very cute. Uh, written by Andrew Siepel. It is 378 pages, $4.99. It is also not available on Kindle Unlimited for very similar reasons to the other one. The author has had a lot of his the stuff available for free on the Royal Road and other places. Um, he'd recently had some issues with um, Amazon, so I think he's taking down a lot of it. But still, that's why it's not on Kindle Unlimited. Here is the author's description. Threadbare has reunited with his little girl, even if it didn't go exactly like he'd hoped. But war still rages through the kingdom, and the fluffy heroes must stop the tyrant king and restore peace to their home. Celia, Threadbare, and the rest of their allies must join the final resistance to fight for the fate of everyone within Sylvania. It's a daunting task. Fortunately, they're not alone. Dune comes for the tyrant king on a soft, fuzzy little feet. The epic conclusion to the new lit RPG saga. There you go. Um, and like I said, this, is all, this has been a very cute and good series. I think I gave book number one a seven, book number two an eight. It was even better than book one. Um, and this one didn't quite fulfill those same shoes. Uh, I gave it an awesome meal score of six out of ten. Again, not a bad score. It just means it didn't work for me. Not boring in any way, shape, or form. It's still written. And most of the stuff that you love from those first two books are here. Um, for me, even though I wanted to like this one, um, it just... I just couldn't get into the premise of it. Um, and and it, it, the, the, the points of the series are so very similar. It's um, the main character. So a skill gains, he's a very cute, cuddly murder bear golem. Um, him and his crew, I just, the premise for it just didn't make sense to me. And so it was hard for me to like to, to kind of fall into the story. Like it with the other ones. Um, Cause remember in the first book, it's an introduction to the world. You get the game mechanics, you get um, kind of the storyline set into motion where the main character's um, trying to gain power and strength to help his, his person, his little girl. And then she's taken at the end of that novel. And book two, uh, set like 10, I think like 10 years in the future, is him, full, again, still training to try to save his little girl. Um, and there's a bunch of adventure and action and stuff. And he creates some allies. Uh, and there's all, it's all very purposeful. Except at the end of book two, he gets his little girl back. And while the beginning of this novel is like very much like, oh, getting her into a body, um, doing some exploration, like um, skill gains, getting people's classes and training. Ultimately, the story is about something that wasn't with the original premise, which is like, oh, conquering the kingdom and restoring justice for all. And I'm like, why bother? You got the thing you wanted. Uh, so for me, like the, the core core of this idea was like, oh, he has to save his little girl. And once he has her, that was kind of the purpose. It wasn't to create a kingdom. It wasn't to like, you know, stand for truth and justice and the threadbare way. Um, it was always like, oh, he, that's his goal as a teddy bear to get his person. And he got her in book number two. And so book number three always felt to me like, oh, what's the purpose? Why don't they just like leave the kingdom when they're immortal golems? Um, they can live in the desert or in the ocean or like at the top of a really cold mountain and be left alone for forever. Um, and instead, this is just a writing choice, and it's just one that didn't click with me. It doesn't mean th there are a lot of people who really like the series, and like I said, this is not bad writing. This is still very entertaining for a lot of people. It's just that it, it couldn't click for me because I couldn't get into the premise of this particular third book in this series. So that's all it is. And again, um, plenty of RPG advancement, crafting, fighting, all the good stuff is story. Um, I just didn't land, and that you know that happens sometimes. Doesn't mean it's bad. It's just didn't click for me, but it might click for you. Uh, get the score of six out of ten. Threadbare Volume Three: The Right to Arm Bears. Still a cute title. Uh, with the score of six out of ten. There we go. Okay, next we have Dungeon Guild, a lit RPG dungeon core adventure. Glendaria Awakens Trilogy Book Number Three, <laughs> written by Jonathan Brooks. Here we go. Um, this is 174 pages for 3.99. Kind of expensive. Um, it is available on Kindle Unlimited, so that's all, always nice. Here's the author's description. The long-awaited conclusion to the Glendaria Awakens trilogy. After their dungeon core was stolen, Devin headed out headed out of their dungeon, searching for those who had taken it. And initially confused on where he could it could be located, he followed a vague feeling in his chest towards a distant destination. Finding help from a guild of players who also want to return the core, they embark on a mission to reacquire and return it before time runs out. There you go. That's the author's description. Um, I think it is a little... That's essentially the first like 35% of the story. 
Um, and everything else after that is going back to your regular dungeon stuff that you had in books one and book two. Um, this is the conclusion of the series. It brings together again a lot of the loose threads, not all of them though. Um, the romantic issues with the two main characters, that's all resolved by the end of the story. Um, the storyline again of the dungeon core being stolen is ironed out by the 30% mark actually. Um, after that again, it's back to just dungeon level making. Um, monster mashing, uh, like creating new kinds of monsters and dungeon diving from other players. Um, and it's like I said, it's kind of a repeat from the other things in the other two novels. Um, there are a couple new things in this, in this particular book that, that are changing. Of course, um, the ability to make a dungeon town above ground adds like a minor aspect of like dun- uh, town conquest between players. Um, there's also the guild aspect and the, the, the guild that sides with the character Devin, um, the one who goes chasing after the Dungeon Core. Um, that introduces like some more regular characters for the story to play around with. And that is, is a nice expansion because for most of the first, first and second book, it was mostly just two people. And them kind of looking at other people, characters, uh, players as they go through the dungeon. But it was mostly them. And then they occasionally would go to like someone else's point of view, the, like a, a, this, this guild who's initially antagonist towards the, towards the core in the dungeon. And so bringing them in as like, oh, they're on the dungeon side. Oh, that adds a more c- uh, camaraderie aspect. And so that's a little more um, ability to like do some joking around, have some interplay with more more than two people as characters uh, in a very fun, interesting way. So those were always good things. Um, so the story just felt a little less lonely. Um, overall, though, it just, you know, it was okay. It wasn't, a lot of it is just like, again, if you've read books one and you've read two, read two the dungeon creation stuff and the dungeon running stuff is, is basically the same. Like you've read those, you've read all this already. Um, it's not bad. It's just nothing really new. And it was definitely nice to see like the romance tied up at the end. It happens exactly the way you probably thought it was going to be, but it was still cute. Um, and again, just different monsters, different divers, but basically the same kind of novel overall. Again, not getting a bad score. Um, it wasn't boring per se. It just wasn't like, um, particularly good because because you kind of see where everything was going and it was just like oh, I've, I've read this before a lot of it with the exception of the first 30 percent uh so for me it gets a score of again six out of ten if you've just been following the series you'll probably have a good time you know just finishing it up at least um but it's dungeon guild a lit rpg dungeon core adventure glendaria awakens trilogy book number three with a score of six out of ten there you go okay on to Number five, let's see. The Slaver of Ver Tim Lit RPG, episode number two, written by Robert Mendehim. There you go. Um, it is uh, 31 pages, 99 cents. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, I'll read you the author's description. In this Ver Tim Lit RPG episode, Rain and Maine gain a new party member. They also meet a slaver named Eric who takes a fancy to Maine. And Rain has a strange experience that might help him understand a little more about what's going wrong with the virtual game world. And that is an accurate description of what happens. And that's kind of all that happens. Um, this is, again, 30 pages for 99 cents, which is too expensive, but the author can't lower the price past 99 cents, to be honest. So that's about that's as low as it can go. So um, if you want to read this in Kindle Unlimited, that's up to you. Um, my review basically is that I tried episode one, and I'm like, okay, this is kind of rough. The game mechanics aren't like super explainy. Um, but like, there's enough that like, okay, I'm curious about book number two. And I was like, okay, this is fine. This is good enough. I'll read book number two and we'll see how that goes. And I've read episode number two and there's really no advance in the story. Like it doesn't get more interesting. If anything, there are probably fewer game mechanics here. Um, because you, the author is already kind of assumed, oh, he's explained some stuff to you. Um, the story takes off with, starts off with the new trio of players getting ambushed by a slaver who takes two of the girls. The guy in the group feigns death until he's found by the main characters from episode one, Rain and Maine. And, you know, he picks up by them and they basically go chase after the guy. Um, and then there's also like this um, dream-ish sequence where there are hints about for the main character, like who is what's going on in the world. And I'm like, that's not super interesting. Uh, like, it, like it can be potentially, but it's not really developed here. It's just like, oh, here's a key. You go through a portal. End of story. I'm like, oh, OK. Um, that was kind of it. It's just like, oh. Like I said, not a ton of actual story development. Um, a couple of fights, and that's kind of it. Uh, it just wasn't enough to draw me into like another episode. So for me, it was like it's a score of five out of ten. Kind of bored with it. And like I said, episode one was I'm like okay, I'll try it out. Episode two, I'm like okay, I tried it out. 
this is kind of the end for me. Um, so that's a slaver, Vertim, Lit RPG episode number two, with a score of five out of ten. Sorry. Okay, on to Dead Man Gaming, a Liberty series written by A.J. Markham. There we go. Um, this cover, honestly, was very not engaging. Like, I looked at this cover the first time I thought, this is, this cover wasn't, I keep I'm saying, I wasn't enthused by this cover. Um, uh, but I, I ultimately ended up really enjoying myself. So it is uh, 624 pages, $2.99. So an amazing price for this particular series, for this novel, um, available on Kindle Unlimited. So over 600 pages. Two ninety nine. That's like half of a cent a page, I think. So good. Here is the um, author's description. Ex safe cracker Jimmy Sabalowski was just trying to help an old friend stay alive when the FBI framed him. But rather than send Jimmy to prison, the feds have an interesting offer: play the world's largest virtual reality video game MMORPG um, as an undead rogue, infiltrate the Russian mafia who have set up an in-game crime empire that while masquerading as orcs, and do it all within three weeks. Now, Jimmy is racing against the clock, and the FBI is threats to put him behind bars. With the help of an elf, a druid, and a goblin he befriends in the game, he might just have a shot at completing the quest, or getting killed by the Russian mob in real life. So there you go. That is the author's description. Um, there you go. Oh, sorry, I missed a bit. Um, he got framed to play the game. There you go. Um, this story kind of has one of the sillier premises I re ever read. Um, as little a, a fresh at a jail safe cracker is entrapped by the FBI and recruited to infiltrate the Russian mafia inside a fantasy VR MMO. Um, only he's never played a video game, or at least that's what it feels like. Um, and the beginning of the novel is, is genuinely frustrating and yet somehow it won me over and I had a good time reading the story overall. It was really one of those, just like, okay. I'll describe the beating for you. Like the first seven percent of the novel is just like this conf convoluted, uh, convoluted backstory about how the main character Jimmy got into crime, how he went bad, how he's been in and out of prison, and a bunch of stuff that isn't important to the story. Um, it, it's 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 like character development stuff, but it doesn't really add anything to the story, and it actually conflicts with the character that you see in game because in the first seven percent, he sees, he's presented as this criminal, someone who's been in jail. Um, so you'd assume there's a, there's a certain level of um, either charisma or toughness in that particular persona. Um, and yet in in the game, he comes off as a super noob. Um, so basically, all you really need to know is that the day that the main character gets released from a seven uh, sorry six-year prison stint, he's convinced by his best friend to do one last job to save that friend's little brother's life. And instead, he's captured by the FBI and forced to do this virtual infiltration thing and that's just how they get him in the game uh the next 30 percent is essentially what i call a noob's tale in the game world basically this is a version of like wow fantasy fiction um using like the undead race as the base the main character constantly asks question after question after question on every single game you're like he, he's really is playing a super noob because he apparently he's never played a fantasy game before he's never played a vr uh, mmo game so he asks questions about everything um every concept every ability every action every ui piece every how, what's this question mark above their head at versus a an exclamation point what's a quest what what's this thing killing me um how do i kill it back how, what happens if I, you know, it goes on like it really is a noob experience and it 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 was frustrating for me because i haven't been a noob in a really long time and but for some people um the story is very reminiscent of their own noob experience. Like everybody's been a noob at some point. So we all can kind of empathize with, oh, that's, yeah, that's that's legitimately how, you know, we all felt when we first, like, what are all these great things? Um, but at the same point, there's a really good reason why not everybody in who plays an MMO wants to shepherd a noob when they come into the group. Um, because it can be a very frustrating experience. And that's kind of what I felt with the, with the, the beginning portion of like the game section. Um, now, if you can get to this part, if it doesn't frustrate the heck out of you, there's like there's a good story. There is. Um, once the main character hooks up with the group who's willing to put up with his questions and his whining, um, things actually do get interesting. Um, so if you can push to that beginning portion of it, there's a good story here. Um, there's loads of good banter between the group members. Um, and there's a ton of like 
that's what she said jokes. So if that's your kind of humor, this will probably land with you. Um, and the noob stuff kind of peters out by the 50% mark. Um, when the story turns towards back towards that actual premise we talked about, um, it becomes a combination of like a plan to infiltrate the Russian mob and a bank heist story, which was like, oh, that's okay. That's a choice. I didn't see that coming. Um, but don't actually expect to see the bank heist till like the last 20% of the novel. Um, the group dynamics and the humor, if it lands for you, is probably where the story highlights the most. Like there's there's a lot of good banter there. There's a lot of good camaraderie. And like the the, the quests that they go on and the examples that they use for, for common and stuff, like feels very um, experiential. Like if you've ever played WoW, if you've ever played like the Undead Faction, a lot of these these quests are going to be some, they're going to feel real familiar to you. Um, and you know, it's some, that might be a nostalgia trip for you, but also might f- make you feel like you're there because you've already experienced those things. So it, it it can be a way to connect with this particular aspect of the story. Um, and though the fundamental premise of the story doesn't really make sense, like why would you have this criminal be your inside man in a game he's never played and he's not really computer literate and he doesn't know how to play the game, but you're going to use him because he's a thief and you think the thief is going to be able to infiltrate the Russian mafia who's doing these online transactions on the game, I guess. Somehow the story kind of works as far as like the bank heist stuff goes. Um, although I also warn you, there's a big cliffhanger at the end. And so if that's a thing for you, just an FYI, it is, it's a big cliffhanger. Um, and it doesn't really make sense, but you know, it is what it is. Um, overall, I guess if you can get past all the noob stuff, um, this is a good story. It really is. Um, if you can't ignore that, don't pick it up. <laughs> it's going to drive you crazy. Um, uh, you might end up throwing your Kindle across the room. Like, like Jimmy, there were, there were some sections in the beginning of this novel where I was like, Stop asking these questions. Just, I, just, I had to put it down because I was like genuinely frustrated with the noob question stuff. And I was like, so like I said, but if you can get past that, it's, it's, it's generally good and it's fun. Uh, for me, it's a score of seven out of 10. Uh, that's Dead Man Gaming, a little RPG series uh, with the score of seven out of 10. I, I ended up liking it. Yeah. Okay. On to our next review. This one is Tales of the Jim Smith, uh, chapter number one, a Liberty Adventure series, uh, Alderaan Worlds, uh, written by Jared Mandani. Mandani. Mandani, I think it is. Okay, here's the author's uh, it's actually, um, 469 pages, $3.98, good price point, um, available on Kindle Unlimited. Here is the author's description um, Could a mere crafter be the world's savior? All Dean Winters ever aspired to be was left in peace and to make a living as make a living of his passion as a jewel smith. Fresh out of college, he managed to open his shop to sell his creations and get a toehold in the business. But like most people who start out in life, the beginnings were rough and he had to struggle. Still, he wouldn't want it any other way. One evening while he's busy in his workshop, three men in Baklavas break in and he's violently assaulted. That burglary will leave him crippled and traumatized. And after weeks of rehabilitation, he will finally have to accept that he's never again going to be able to use his fingers with enough dexterity to pursue his meticulous occupation. Dean is devastated. What will he now do with himself? It In the unit he, where he's treated, a glimmer of hope will emerge when he'll be introduced to a virtual world that, will ease, that eases your limitations and where no dream is big or wild enough. Um... He will join Alderaan as a major artificer, and he will soon discover that by drawing from his real-life skills, he can progress through the levels much faster. Going from one adventure to a, to the other, Mage Winters will meet legendary players and formidable foes, but right when he thinks he found a new purpose, he will learn of the ominous danger that threatens everyone he's come to cherish, and that his particular skills might be the only hope to save them all. That's a lot of n- novel description. Um, with... I went into this really hopeful. I'll say that. Um, I love crafting um, as, as a part of Liberty. It's, it's just, it's a thing for me. I love the idea of like um, not having to progress as a fighter necessarily, but be a creator in a story and to be a maker and to still be able to progress as a class. So the fact that it's a uh, gemsmith was really appealing. The cover art is also really appealing. Um, and with a title like the gemsmith, I picked it up thinking it would be a crafting story. And I'm not the only one. There are, there, there are several other reviews who were like, had the same kind of thought when they, when they saw this. Um, and I mean, the main character in the story is a jeweler in real life and an artificer in the game. However, I really couldn't have been more disappointed. Um, in the entire like 469 pages, there are literally only a couple instances of crafting in the entire thing. And, and if you're looking at this as a crafting story, 
skip it. It's not. It really isn't. Like those those classes might it might as well not exist. It, it's just like, oh, he's the magic chosen one. Suddenly he's going to save us. And this is how he happens to be a jeweler or a gemsmith or whatever it is. And so I'm like, that's kind of what it comes out to be. Um, Story wise, the entire thing feels forced. Um, the main character gets his hands broken in robbery. Um, so he uses a virtual reality game as physical therapy, which is weird uh, because it doesn't actually do anything. Um, in the game, like he's not, he, it's, one, it's not one of those virtual reality situations where like he's in a rig and he's moving all his fingers and his body, you know, actually to, to do things in the game. It's, he puts on a headset and it communicates with his brain. Um, and so the, I don't really, the whole premise of like it, it, it being a form of virtual reality, while hypothetically is something that happens in real life for things like phobias or for things like actually like training and simulations, like, oh, seeing how it is virtually and then applying those skills in real life, it doesn't really pan out here as like an actual premise. Um, so that was already annoying me when I started this off. Um, however, once he's in the game, um, he gets an apprenticeship with a level 20 dwarf artificer who happens to die the next day and leave his entire shop to the main character, um, including his lab and his equipment. Uh, who, so a guy, he's literally known for a day and he just happened to take in as an apprentice. Um, and then the main character is suddenly swept along on an adventure of, uh, to find the rings of power. I mean, the Orobodox crystals, basically the same thing. Um, and I basically lost interest in the story very quickly and I found that everything to be predictable and the storyline to be super forced. Um, game mechanic wise, it's kind of a toss up. Um, much of the story is written in a very fantasy like way with occasional like notifications. Um, in combat and crafting things, things are a little more detailed. Like you actually do get some game information. So this is little RPG. I'm not saying it's not, but um, you you get to see like things like crafting trees and skills and loads of details about spells and items. Um, but then those things are just rare. Like it's only, you only really see the details during crafting scenes, which are there only a couple and in combat where you get like damage notifications and you get like, you know, things like that, but everything else beyond that, the regular everyday stuff or talking with people or characters, it's, 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 it's a lot more rare. And you only really get like quest notifications. There's just like a few little notifications here and there. So like I said, game mechanic wise, it's really just, it's, it's hit or miss a little bit. Um, and on the other side of this, um, the game mechanics and the story don't always, apply um and they feel a little forced or like they don't really matter to the story if there's a plot point that needs to be hit specifically for example at one point when the dwarf mentor dies he um the main character and him are they're off to go they plan to go mine and so this is a tiny bit spoilery um they're gonna go mine and they run into some orcs who are staying over this woman and the main uh the main character's mentor who's like a level 28 character is killed by these two orcs. Like he dies, he die dies. Um, and yet the main character who's still level one, who still only has, who's out of magic. He's, he's, his spells are gone. He's using his starter quarter staff. He's for some way he's able to beat these two other, uh, monster characters who just killed his level 28 mentor. And that makes no logical sense. Like it really doesn't. I mean, um, and I think there's even a point in the story where like the other character, like, that doesn't sound like it makes sense. And I mean, it kind of ties into like the, the forceness of, of the storyline. Um, it's just like, okay, that, 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 that doesn't make sense to my gamer brain. Um, and then very shortly after that, the main character starts jumping up levels. Like he goes from level one to five just by crafting some rings. Um, and then he starts skipping up ahead even more. Um, it, it just, it just when the game mechanics don't make sense, so they don't make like math sense or like, um, they don't connect to, you know, my experience as a gamer or as uh, it's just, I lose interest very quickly. And that kind of what happens here. Um, there was like a story the author wanted to tell and the game mechanics felt forced in a lot of different places so that that story can be told. I'm like, okay, that's, that's a choice. I don't dispute that. Just, it doesn't leave me interested in particular. So there you go. Overall, I just kind of got bored with it because again, I, I was looking for a crafting story and this isn't it. The RPG game t details about the story um, while they were there sometimes were really kind of off and on and there was like in sh these bursts of information and oftentimes they're just kind of ignored for the sake of like, oh, I have to make a story point or this is where the story is going. So forget those game mechanics. They don't really matter. And that's what it felt like, felt like sometimes. Um, and the main character is honestly kind of unlikable, at least to me. He was super whiny, cowardly, um, and I get that that's part of his, his character growth arc. It's just that it just goes on for like a really long time through a lot of the story and he doesn't change. So it is what it is. Um, it didn't only really work for me. 
Um, and I was kind of bored, um, especially when the math doesn't make sense. Um, I get a score of five out of 10. There you go. Tales of the Gensmith chapter one, a Liberty adventure series, um, with the score of five out of 10. There you go. Okay. On to our next review. It is going to be, uh, outpost, a lit RPG adventure monsters and maces book. Number one written by Terry W. Irvin, the second, not the first, the second. Uh, it is 230 pages. It is $2.99. Nice price point. Um, available on Kindle Unlimited. So it's always nice as well. Um, uh, here is the author's description. Glenn, a college sophomore, has a Sociology 102 paper that requires spending time with an unfamiliar group or culture. Um, luckily, two hot girls from his class have the same idea. Attend the university's game club to get reaction material for the papers. A creepy game moderator shows up, ready to start a game of monsters, maces, and magic. Glenn doesn't fret over the GM's disturbing vibe, though, figuring it'll lead to a potential fodder for his paper. Moments after rolling up his character and beginning the adventure, Glenn, his two classmates, and the three other players are drawn into the game, literally. How and why they got trapped in the game, transformed into their RPG characters, are important questions, sure. But simply surviving a world filled with horrific creatures, unknown magic, and perilous roads is the first on the list. There we go. Um, honestly, really good description gives you all the gist of it in the beginning of like the first, um, you know, 30 ish percent, um, for disclosure, I got an advanced copy of this novel for review. I purchased it when it became available. Um, first off, this is, this has got to be one of the lighter lit RPG stories that I think I've ever read. Um, essentially the novel takes the premise from critical failures. If you read that series of the, of a bad dungeon master transporting their players into the game world. Um, however, this one leans a little more towards fantasy. Um, Critical Fears is super humorous. There's a lot of potty humor. It doesn't take it so seriously. And there's like a lot of like talking about the like, game stuff between like the the NPCs or the, the characters in the world and the actual players. And there's also like a ton of players in, this, in that series. So that is one type of story. This one is definitely almost on the other side of the spectrum where it, it it's trying to be a fantasy story um, in a lot of places. And it just happens to also be a, 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 a lit RPG story in that it's a tabletop story, but it, it it's definitely going on the side of like realism and that's going to work for some people. Um, it just didn't work for me. Um, if you've ever read the series guardians of the flame, that kind of tries to do the same thing. It's an older series. Um, it, it, that has this same kind of vibe, like where the characters are almost subconsciously referring to game mechanics, but the larger world around it is basically a fantasy story. Um, and that, I might say it's it isn't it's not good. The writing is really nice, it is, but it doesn't really work for me in particular and a lot of other literature readers because those things that we love about the genre is basically that we can see those notifications, we can see all the mechanics behind the world, and it's not hidden from other us or the characters. It's you know it reminds us of like playing an RPG game on our computers or on your tabletop where you see character sheets and you and you make dice rolls and that's part of the experience. It's not just a fantasy story with a few game rules talked about occasionally. Um, and that's what this more leans to. The game mechanics in this particular story are heavily front loaded. Um, before being transported to the game world, everyone sits down and they make their characters um, and you get details about stats and abilities and races and classes and all that stuff there. So there is like a lot of game formation here, but again, it's mostly front load in this section. Um, everyone describes their characters, what roles they made, what they chose through the classes, all that good stuff. There's a lot of good information there. But at the 9% mark, the players are trapped in the game. And a lot of that game stuff just disappears. Um, in the game world, there are no character sheets. There are no notifications. There are no item descriptions. Um, no spell or ability descriptions from pop-up instead. Um, if there is a need to describe a game mechanic, um, it's explained by one of these players talking to the other ones. Or as one person thinking about them to themselves. Um, the world and the actions of the characters and the players around them are mostly described in terms of fantasy. Um, and that's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it feels like a fantasy story. And I'm, I'm, and I'm like, I wanted to read a little RPG story. You know what I mean? And, and, and look, some people are, are generally going to like the lighter little RPG stuff. It works for them. It does. But for me, and for, I think for a lot of other readers, it's like, it doesn't always quite work because we're, we're okay with seeing all this, all this information. And that's one of the things we like about it. Like we like learning enough about the system in this world that we can kind of roll our own characters. And that 
you know, that's kind of not always the case here. Um, I'm not saying that the world isn't ruled by those game mechanics. It is. It is a little bit of story to me. Um, there's a regular, there's like regular like little nuggets of like game information. Like, oh, this is how reputation works. And this is how, um, you know, your appearance, why the hot elf lady is, is treated better than the ugly goblin character. Um, and, you know, why the the, the gnome um, healer doesn't really hit a lot because he has a bad attack score compared to warriors. I um, mean, there, there are a lot of those little explanations, but they're, they're small pieces um, just like every so often. And then it's like fantasy, 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 little nugget of RPG, fantasy, 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 little nugget of little RPG. You know what I mean? And so that's how the story goes. Um, so there we go. The story itself, it's felt like a decent tabletop adventure um, and dungeon crawl. That's what it ends up being. Um, the group has a goal to earn enough money to afford a resurrection spell to, to bring back their, their fallen member um, and all of their adventures in the town and into the dungeon work to further that goal. And there are some times in the story where you feel like, oh, there was a dice roll made and this is the result. And that's cool except that it's not described that way. So it's more of an inference like, oh, this is the vibe that, that might be the case, but there is definitely no description like, oh, here's a dice roll or here's here's where your attack didn't land or here's a notification saying, oh, you did this much damage. It's all very traditional fantasy. And that kind of makes sense because the author, um, his other novels are fantasy or they're sci-fi. This is his first jump into the little RPG. And I don't doubt that the author has tabletop experience. There are just too many like things at the beginning. Like, oh, okay, that all makes sense. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. I've done that. You know, whatever. But once you get into the actual game story, it it mostly feels like a fantasy story. Um, and you know, overall, it just didn't work for me. Um, again, not bad writing. It isn't. It's not boring. Um, boring is a five. Bad stories are four and below. This is a it gets a score six out of ten. Um, and I said the, the biggest portion of this, why it didn't work for me, says there's an intentional decision to minimize or mute the game mechanics. And it just made the story less interesting for me. Um, it might be, again, a plus for readers who who don't love as much of those things as I do about Little Beach. But the thing I, I personally like about Little Beach is that there's a freedom to put that UI there, to put all those notifications and that tabletop and, and RPG gamers are used to seeing in their games, their tabletops. Um, and it's what like I said, how we kind of relate to these stories and why they're so engaging and, 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 and fun is because we have had those experiences as gamers. We've, we've taken the time to see our characters and, and add up the numbers and see how the how different stats matter or how they in, interact with these skill sets or these, you know, whatever uh, class abilities do, or, you know, we reruled characters 20 times to try to get them an optimized character sheet or whatever. Um, or we love seeing like how the spell trees and the skill trees and the class trees, you know, roll out and all that information that, that, and just, all those things are missing from the story after again, after they get into the actual game. Um, like I said, you might enjoy the story more if you don't like notifications or characters in your story. Um, but for me, it just didn't hit the mark. Um, again, not bad. just didn't work for me. Uh, score of six out of 10 outpost, a little RPG adventure, monster maces and magic book. Number one with the score of six out of 10. There you go. Let's try that again. There we go. Number nine. Okay. Archaic Venture. The Myth of Cerberus. A little bit adventure, fantasy, MMORPG, little bit series, book number one. Such a long title. Um, written by Henry D. Milton. Um, I think someone needs to look at different cover art. I've seen this particular character before in someone else's series. Um, here we go. Uh, this one is actually a little bit... Um, I don't know how many exactly many pages it is. As of this recording, Amazon doesn't have it a page count. I'm estimating at about a hundred pages. It's ninety nine cents, so it's it's for what it is. It's it's reasonably priced. It is also available on Kindle Limited. Here is the author's description: Step inside a new reality, a virtual reality, a reality that could change Michael forever. Archaic Adventure, a brand new virtual reality video game, is hot off the press and is selling like hotcakes. However, the creator of the game, Soto Akiyama, has thrown in a twist. The game will no longer function correctly until someone defeats the evil spirit plaguing the lands of Archaic Venture. That doesn't make sense, but whatever. Along with returning Archaic Venture to normal, there is a cash prize that goes with it. For Michael Maddox, a 16-year-old that suffers from cerebral palsy and dysfunctional game home life, um, this game and that money could turn his entire life around. There you go. Uh, <laughs> um, the first 20% of this novel 
is character developed for the main character in real life. Um, it's actually not bad. It really isn't. Um, it, it, I have to say this is probably the best written portion of this novel. Um, the real life story of a teen with cerebral palsy who feels like he's a burden to his parents. It feels very um, emotional and you can really empathize with the character. Um, he, The cost of his physical therapy is creating a burden on his parents financially and it's also creating a strain in their marriage. And you get to see him seeing that happens in the story. Like you get to see him, him looking at his parents and seeing them argue about him. Like he's not there. Um, and you get to see him at his work, um, being made fun of by the local football team because he's different. Um, and you, you, the, that particular portion of the story feels really fleshed out and it feels like there's, um, uh, experiential moments in someone's life that are being drawn from. Cause there, it feels, it feels very full. It feels very fleshed out. Like I can, I, I when I'm, reading that section, I can kind of feel that small town judgmental vibe. Um, and there's definitely like a good amount of empathy that's created for the character. So I'm like the first one percent, like I said, well written. It's, it's, it's a good piece. However, once you get into the game world, after the 20% mark, things go down and it's like, is this the same author? I honestly asked that myself at one point, um, in terms of like quant quality and content of the novel, there's a huge nosedive. Um, the game world isn't described at all. It feels very flat. Dialogue feels forced and awkward. And I'll give you an example of like what a dialogue piece is and, and what I mean. Um, at one point, this is an actual line from the story. Someone talking to another person. Excuse us. Do you mind give us a second to talk privately? Komodo asked politely. Sorry, Komodo said politely. It should be asked. So Komodo said politely. And that's just like, a, it's a very common example, like how, how the dialogue is featured. Um, not only about that, but it's also an example like, oh, there are a lot of technical issues in the writing of this novel. Like if you read the reviews in this novel, that's one of the things that comes up the most is like, oh, this needs another editing pass. Uh, this should have been proofread better. Um, there are missing words. There are wrong words used, like um, using the word through instead of um, say T-H-R-O-U-H uh, -T instead of T-H-R-E-W. Um and it might've been the case that the author was like using a uh, speech and text program and just didn't edit correctly. Um, but either case, he's asking you to pay money for these errors. Um, and there's just generally bad sentence structure a lot of times. Um, now on the game mechanic side, there's not really one. Um, the story is definitely sent to VR game. Um, the word level is used, but it doesn't really mean much in his first fight. For example, the main character who's level two, um, he, there, there's a portion of characterization where he, Take some time to describe what kind of character he wants and why. And then once he's in the game, those things aren't really referenced at all ever again. Uh, so I'm like, what's the point of having a class or a race if it doesn't matter in the story? But that's a, that's a side point. Um, he's in a bar, he's level two, and he's in a bar fight with the, with the pickup group he got. And for some reason, he's able to murder a much higher level character with like a single stroke of a sword and decapitate the guy. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. You should be dead. Um... Uh, and, and at the same point, there's, there's a warlock who's fighting another team member here who's, who's, who's an orc warrior barbarian, I believe. And the warlock and him are, they're fencing and they're evenly matched. Like the skinny little warlock who's a caster is matched up with an orc barbarian in melee combat and they're equal. Like that doesn't make sense at all. Um, and again, in the story, like the levels really don't matter. Like there's a lot of levels keeping like within the space of a paragraph, the main character goes from level two to 30. And it's a summary of like, Oh, we fought this monster. We gained seven levels. We fought this monster. We gave another 17 and we fought this one. We gained another 20. Uh, and that's he's literally what it is. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly, not being specific, but it's one paragraph and it goes from level two to 30. And there you go. And that's kind of the extent of the game mechanics. There are no character sheets. There's no stats, no health bars, ability descriptors, item descriptions, none of that. And I'm like, okay, this, like, thanks. Um, the, the story itself in the game world, also really weak. There's a contest to defeat this bad monster. Um, and honestly, it's not really worth mentioning. It doesn't really amount to much. Um, overall, the outside of the story at the real world stuff was, like I said, the first one, I'm like, oh, this is, this is not bad. This is pretty good. I'm like, uh, and I say good stuff there, but the almost non-existent game mechanics and the repeated technical errors knock it down a point for me. Um, I, I, even without the technical stuff, it was, it was a five out of 10 because of the technical stuff and the lack of game mechanics four out of 10. Like I genuinely am like, Oh, at the end of this, I was like, I don't like this story. 
Um, so for me, Archaic Adventure, The Myth of Cerberus, a little RPG adventure, um, gets a score of 4 out of 10. There you go. Okay, on to, let's see, number 10. A New Life, Young Again in Another World, volume number one, written by Mine. I think there's an actual title name, so I just don't have it. I, this is a translated novel um, from another country. Here we go. It is, uh, I'll be in another issue with page count. Amazon didn't have them as, as of the recording. I'm estimating at about 200 pages. I think that's pretty reasonable. It is priced at $6.99, though, and it is not available on Kindle Limited. So price-wise, that is super expensive. Like it's about three times what I normally look to pay for, uh, for a little bitty novel and content wise, it's not worth it for a lot of people. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Okay. Here is the author's description. Um, when Depp tapped Rainya Kunga on the shoulder, he smiled and went willingly after enjoying a nice long life of 94 years, he was looking forward to shutting his eyes for a little time. Um, he was, therefore, understandably upset when he woke up again in an empty space devoid of memories and with a young girl in a tunic rambling on and on about how she's God. So he did what any reasonable person would have done under the circumstances. He sent a flying kick. He, he sent the girl flying with the kick to her face. Um, it turned out that the girl was indeed God and she was in a pinch. She urgently needed someone to do some interdimensional resource smuggling and Raina fit the bill. His mission crossed the boundary into another world, then chill for a few decades. God would handle the rest. To sweeten the deal, she offered him an 18-year-old body, um, like his reincarnated body, not a, a young woman's body, and a whole laundry list of ludicrously powerful skills, yet he re remained hesitant. Then she mentioned the food. An exotic world comes with exotic delicacies, and, is, and this sealed the deal. The next thing he knew, he was standing in a foreign land, younger, stronger, and more clueless than ever. Will he survive the world? And more importantly, will the world survive him? Okay, like a lot of this novel is humorous. Uh, so that, that entire first description is meant as humor. Um, so this is, again, a translated work. Um, this novel incorporates an RPG mechanics with a transported to the fantasy world story. Um, there's some good action. It's not a ton in there. Um, it's a little innuendo. So there's some, there's no sex, but there is like, there's an attempt to seduce, I guess I'll say. And there's regular references that go on the covers, chestiness. Um, and the... And it's mostly a slice of life story. So just be aware of what you're getting into. Um, what I wasn't expecting to see in the novel was the humor element. Like it's generally, it, it, it intends to be a funny story. Um, and the first 20% is essentially a comedy scene where a goddess tries to convince the main character, who's a soul she pulled from Earth, to be reincarnated into this RPG fantasy world. And the RPG fantasy world has notifications, ranks, levels, and it just covers the whole thing. It's not super heavy, um, but relative to like what this genre is, which is mostly light novel stuff, um, it, it it fits into Little BD. Um, if you've seen any anime or manga recently, uh, the type of humor used here should be kind of familiar to you. Like there's there's a lot of things that you're like, oh, if you if you if you love that kind of stuff, you're like, oh, I get that joke, or I get that kind of cultural reference, or I get that behavioral pattern as being like supposed to be a jokey kind of humor thing. Um, and well, I, I personally thought it was funny. The humor is not going to land with everybody. Like it really isn't. Like some, I um, there were other reviews who were like, it's not appropriate for a ninety-four year old man to kick a lady in the face. I'm, I, I couldn't get into it. I'm like, that was a huge joke, and it just didn't land with that person. And that's okay. It, it's not all humor does. Um, and so I will always recommend because the thing is so expensive. Um, go download the sample chapter. It's 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 going to be the first ten percent of it, and that's that's going to leave you in the um in that first scene where he's arguing with the, with the goddess about why she wants him to come to the re, um, reincarnated world. And well, he basically doesn't want to, and she has to convince him. And there's a bunch of joke stuff there. Um, and either the humor is in land for you or it isn't, it's kind of the way it is going to be. Um, and again, the novel is kind of pricey. So go, but it is in line with the cost of what translations cost. Like if you look at magic dome books or like a bunch of other you know, Russian stuff or any of their light novels that are translating English, six ninety nine isn't too far off the, the average there. It's just expensive to get things translated from other languages. There's the translation cost and then there's like the re editing stuff where you have to like edit it for an English narrator or audience because things change. And, and so there's a whole thing. Um, so price wise, it's not 
out of the realm of what's normal. But again, for your regular Liberty audience who looks for a price point about uh, a penny a page, three cents a page is kind of a lot. And again, it's not on Kindle Unlimited. Um, content wise, this is the first volume of the series. Um, and so it's kind of equivalent to like the first two episodes of an anime series as far as like what's happening here. Um, and it's not a ton. Like again, that first 30% is essentially him in heaven or in a heaven talking to a goddess for like 30% of the novel, just jokes, making humor, going back and forth. There's some banter um, and a lot of like situational humor. Then once he's in the, in the world, the other like 70% is like him um, figuring how things work out. Um, there's a little bit of action. There's some, a lot of rules being like telling me what the world's about, like what to like um, character development. Um, but it's a lot of it's slice of life. And there's a lot of like dialogue and there's a lot of like, Oh, this is what the world is. I don't, you know, um, and just him kind of figuring out he's a little overpowered um, and, and getting, information on his history. There are these interludes every so often from the goddess's point of view saying, oh, this is information. And it's a, it's, it's a little break for humor again. Um, and hopefully this novel is like a setup for a really interesting series. Um, and that's what I'm hoping. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. I did. Overall, I liked the novel. I thought it was funny and entertaining. Um, it felt fresh compared to some of the normal Western liturgy that we that, that I've been reading weekly because, again, it's different cultural point of views. It has that anime manga vibe to it as a, as a light novel. Um, but for the price, it is expensive and it's not going to work for everybody. It isn't. Um, I suggest, again, you download a sample, see if the humor works for you. I think a lot of the other stuff will work for your general um, liturgy audience. Um, for me, it worked and I don't mind paying the price, but I also, you know, it's it's part of the job. Um, so I give a score of seven out of 10, but again, go check the sample first. Um, and that's new life young again in another world volume number one with a score of seven out of 10. There you go. Okay. Next one. Last one, actually, uh, Dakota Kraut's ritualist, the completest chronicles. Uh, this is the completest chronicles book number one. Here we go. 323 pages, $4 and 99 cents. Super awesome price. Um, available on Kindle Unlimited. You could, so, well, good price. Um, here we go. The author's description. The decision to start a new life is never an easy one. But for Joe, the transition was far from figurative, becoming a permanent addition to a game world. It doesn't take long to learn that people with his abilities are actively hunted. In fact, if the wrong person gave knowledge of what he is capable of, assassins would appear in droves. In his pursuit of power, Joe fights along his team, completes quests, and delves into the mysteries of his class, which he quickly discovers can only be practiced in secret. Ultimately, his goal is to complete every mission, master every ability, and learn all the world's aspects. All he has to do is survive long enough to make it happen. And that description is, it's not, it's accurate, it is. Um, it it, it kind of starts you off like, I don't know, halfway through the story though. Um Honestly, I like this story. I do. I liked it a lot. Um, and you know how I can tell? Basically, when I was re when I was reading this thing, I kind of forgot I was supposed to review it. Uh, that's how engaging it was for me, at least. It was like 10, 15% of the novel before I remembered, oh, I'm supposed to be taking notes because I'm supposed to be reviewing that. I was just, I was just enjoying it. I was having a good time reading it. And that's always a good quality in a novel when I can just kind of forget um, that I'm supposed to be like, taking those and I can just chill and hang out and enjoy this story. And that's what this does for me. Um, as, as a general concept, most of the story is a slice of life um, concept. It's a slice of life story. It puts an injured field medic into a fantasy VR MMORPG. And he's in the game by the 8% mark. A lot, everything before that is him in the real world dealing with stuff and you know, his issues, but he's in the game by the 8% mark. Um, he's taking virtual tests to see what class he'll be, what he'd be eligible for. Which the whole character creation thing was actually kind of fun and interesting. I like that way of like, um, deciding what character classes he could do. It was, it was interesting. Um, during the testing, he gets an opportunity to get a rare class with some unique benefits in the game. He's pretty squishy. And so the class that he chooses is ultimately you know, the one in the cover. Um, but he uses those restrictions to his physical, well, being like his low health and his low stamina to kind of take a different way of um, progressing in the story. He uses research and he develops different ways to advance that aren't your general, I'm going to murder all the monsters and level up that way. Like he does things differently than the other characters. And I think that's one of the things I like about the story the most is that he doesn't become this overpowered murder machine. Um, instead, he he basically has a class that's going to be super powerful late game in like the super high levels. But at this early point, he's weak and he's vulnerable and he, he, he doesn't 
he doesn't just give up though. He instead he uses what he can to develop differently. Like he starts taking on quests that nobody else is doing, social quests and quests of the library and quests of like different research facilities. And he does research into his own skill sets and he learns about a lot of other things that um that are just different ways of progressing than just like murder everything. Um and he he actually does a lot of research and experimentation. Um and more and more over time he figures out how to use that information to expand his spell repertoire. And it was kind of just fun to follow his research trail. Um I'm I'm definitely the kind of guy who who loves to research like how to minimax a character, how to make it super efficient, and then to test out its abilities. And I think this particular character class this particular character class of the ritualist has a lot of great possibilities. Um, and I don't want to spoil any of the game mechanics or any of like the fun stuff. Cause that's part of the discovery fun for me. Um, but I think it, it in book two, three, four, he can be super, super powerful. And I'm looking forward to reading that particular journey. Um, I don't worry though. There's still like plenty of questing and monster killing and all the other XP grind stuff you might be used to, but um, the main character also can't hunt alone. So you also get this introduction of like group dynamics and guild mechanics and player versus player and guild versus guild kind of concepts. Um, and there are hints at a larger plot line in this series, um, but it's not something that's really developed right now. And it's mostly size of life up until like the 73% mark when it starts to deal with exclusively with the mages guild. And that that's a whole thing. Uh, and it's, it becomes its own little section of the story. Uh, overall, I had a good time reading it. I really did. It was super enjoyable. Um, it didn't quite reach an eight for me, but it got pretty close. Uh, it did. Um, for me, it gets a score of seven out of 10. That's the ritualist, the completest chronicles book. Number one with the score of seven out of 10. It's out now. Go pick it up. There you go. That's it. Everybody press the button. Ramon. There you go. Um, Thank you very much for listening for, for to me talk about Literary G this entire time. Um, remember, you can follow us on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Patreon. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast, you want to support us in any way, shape, or form, you come out all the ways to do so at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. And again, thanks for hanging out with me, folks. Until we can hang out again, remember to read some Literary G. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>